Today, I want to talk to you about the power of dwelling in unity. I'm going to be taking this over the next two weeks. And this is a verse of scripture that it's Psalm 133. It's the whole chapter. It's verses one through three. When we read it in our devotions, we're like so happy it came up because it's only three verses, right? You know? And um, it's stuff that we kind of glaze on plates and we put in our break front or, you know, we have these scripture pictures that we make. And it's a very poetic um, scripture that sounds very beautiful, but, but the Lord put it on my heart this week and I just, it just, and as I was praying, he just gave me this illustration and I just, I just followed him and, and he said, just study this passage. And so we're going to just extrapolate what the word of God has to say to us today from this passage. It's the technical term is exegesis for those of you theological nerds, uh, there with us what we're doing, but let's read it. And let me, let me, let me give you some context to this passage. Have you ever been far away from home for a long period of time? You know, maybe even you haven't been physically away from home, but have you ever had a work, a stretch at work where it just felt like all you did was go home to sleep and it felt like life had just been removed from you? David was in a position where he was running from Saul. You see, he was anointed by Samuel to be the next king of Israel after Saul, but Saul had lost his anointing. He became a madman. He starts chasing David to the point where even when David worshipped to calm the demonic spirits uh, that were rising up in him, he would throw a spear at David and pin him to the wall. It got so aggravated that the next king of Israel, I want you to think about it, you're anointed to be the next king of Israel, you're like the king-elect, okay? And instead of being, you know, like when the president-elect is elected uh, president, Secret Service starts protecting that person even before the election. In this case... (laughs) There was nobody protecting David. He was out on his own. He was without the security of, of his covering of his nation. And he was running from the king that he had to wait for him to pass in order for him to take the throne. He wound up having to live in caves. And then eventually he had to go and live in Philistia amongst the Philistines. The Philistines were the, were the, the thorn in the flesh of Israel. They were the biggest enemies. It would be like any one of us maybe living in North Korea, Iran, Afghanistan, something like that where, where you didn't do it by choice, but it was the only place that would accept you. You understand? And here's David in this, in this craziness of his life, and he's homesick, and he misses home, and he's, and he's wondering, when will I ever get home? When is this ever going to end? And then he writes these words, thinking about home. They are reminiscent of what he was removed from. And I, and I think maybe you've never been far away from home, but how many people remember what it was like in the pandemic where we couldn't even step foot in this building and it felt like you couldn't be reunited at church? It felt like you were so far away from the fellowship that we're enjoying today. Come on. How many people, you feel it in this place. There's an energy. There's a, there's a love. You just feel like it's good in here. Amen. And that was taken away from us. And so David pens these words. It says in the Amplified, that's what I've been reading from. It says, behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. It is like precious oil of consecration poured on the head, coming down the beard, even the beard of Aaron, coming down upon the edge of his priestly robes, consecrating the whole body. It is like the dew of Mount Hermon coming down on the hills of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing life forevermore. He's reminiscing about his homeland. And the one thing he missed more than anything else was the fellowship of his people and in the presence of the Lord. He missed worship and he missed the blessing of being a community and a family. So let's pray right now because we have that blessing. You're online and you're in person. We have that blessing. Let's just seek the Lord. Father, we thank you for this day. And Lord, I know there are people here from all different walks of life, all different ages, people watching online from all over the world. And Father, everyone needs something in this place. But we rely on your word that says you know what we need even before we ask it. And I thank you through the Holy Spirit's wisdom, you will speak to every person in this room and everyone online that no one would leave empty-handed but that, Father, you have something that you're going to minister from your throne to their lives, and they will be changed by your hand. I'm a crack vessel, Lord. Without you, God, I'm useless. But, Lord, with your Holy Spirit, I thank you. You will speak through me and shine the light of the gospel, and that, Lord, people would know that Jesus is in this place because they sense it through what comes from your throne, through this pulpit, to their hearts. Thank you, Father. 
for safety and blessing over our families this holiday weekend. Thank you, Lord, that we will um, have a reason to be joyful. We will radiate the joy of the Lord. For the joy of the Lord is our strength. And we ask it in Jesus' name and all of God's people said amen and amen. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. Say hi to somebody. Man, I feel like we're having a party here today. God is good. So I'll give me the background to the text. And could you imagine what it was like to be anointed the next king of Israel? I mean, this was a big thing. This is a head of state thing. It wasn't just like, hey, you know, you're going to be the president of the condo association. This was you're going to be the next king. And here's truth number one that I want you to be aware of is that anointing and a dream and even a destiny do not guarantee smooth and eventless roads. Just because you're anointed, just because God has a plan for your life, just because there are big things that God has in store for you does not mean the roads will be smooth. I remember being on a, on a, on a call in the middle of COVID. We didn't know when we were ever going to meet as a church again. And as a presbyter, my role was to gather all of the pastors of the churches in Queens to get them on a Zoom call to speak to our superintendent so that he can encourage us. And so we made the day for the Zoom call, and Pastor Durst was sitting there, and he was talking to these pastors. We, we didn't know when we were going to be able to come back. We didn't know how many people we could have in our churches. Uh, at that point, we were suffering not only numerically. We were such, everybody was wondering, will we even have the funds to go on as a ministry? Uh, the, all these pastors were concerned, and, and many of them like, why is this happening? Some pastors didn't even have online uh, uh, ministries. They didn't have the, the equipment, and it was like everyone was in this frenzy, and I remember Pastor Durst saying this, fair seas never made for a good sailor. Fair seas never made for a good sailor. Now, I know that you guys are not necessarily about to go on your yacht today, but here's the deal. If you want to learn how to sail, you just don't have to sail when the waters are crystal clear. You need to know how to sail when the waters got 10-foot waves. Because what makes you a good captain, what makes you a good sailor, what makes you proficient to drive the craft, amen, is the fact that you've been tested in rough waters so that no matter what the wind does, no matter what the weather does, you're going to get from point A to point B without anybody losing a life. And so you need to understand, what does the Bible say? The testing of your faith develops perseverance. And I want to speak to somebody right now that you may be feeling like you're in the middle of something and you have an anointing on your life and you have a destiny on your life, but your reality doesn't match the revelation. And you get angry at God. And you're saying, why is this happening? And this is David in this moment. David was anointed. He was a king. And here he is living amongst his enemies. And at times when he was going off to Ziklag, right? Remember, he, he, he wanted to fight with the Philistines to try and join them to help some of their, fight some of their enemies. How many people know that it's really bad when the only people who love you are the ones that are your real enemies? Like the only people he could find sympathy from was the real enemies. It'd be like the New York Yankees coming to me today. And consoling me for the fact that the Mets have gone three losses out of four games. And that Pete Alonso struck out or grounded out yesterday with runners on base, which could have helped win the game that I was at. I sat in that heat for hours to watch them lose. <laughs> but anointing in a dream did not guarantee for smooth, eventless roads. A calm sea never made for a good sailor. You see, I want you to write this down. The process is the formation of you so you can hold the promise. The process is the formation of you so you can hold the promise. And God knew that David needed to be formed in order so that he can hold the, not only the position, but the weight of the position. Because everybody wants a position, but nobody understands the weight of a position. Everyone wants to be married, but nobody understands that men, oh, Lord, Marriage makes more problems. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to say that. All these newly, these people just about to get into it. <laughs> All the married couples, help me out. Marriage is good, right? <laughs> All the wives, raise your hand, honey. <laughs> but marriage doesn't, if you think that a ring is going to make all the problems go away, the problems that existed before in the marriage will only be greater if you don't work on that marriage. Marriage takes work. You don't get to 25 years of marriage without working on a marriage. 
and it takes work. And so how many people know, and all the married couples tell me this, that, that if you work through it with your spouse through the hard times, it actually builds you up to be better and more in love. You got to help me out more than that. We got people about to get married. And that was kind of like, I guess. How many married couples will say, when you walk through the fire, Shaka Khan wrote it, through the fire, through the limb. Come on now. When you walk through the fire and you come out on the other side better, you're more in love, you're stronger, and life is good. (laughs) Amen. I had to force you to do that, but we'll take it. (laughs) The promise is also in the process. And um, what we are guaranteed, though, and here's the beautiful thing, whether it's marriage or whether it's ministry or whether it's vocation, you want to be the manager, but you need to realize the manager just doesn't work. The manager has the weight of the responsibilities on them, right? So here's the deal. This is the thing you can understand. If you're in a, a valley of your life right now, if you're in a position where you're saying, my, my reality doesn't match the revelation, where even what you read in the Word of God doesn't match where your life is right now. I want you to hold on to the Word that says, He who began the good work in you will carry through to completion. Come on now. He who began the work in you will carry it through to completion. Look at somebody and tell them it's not over. It's not over. God's not done with you yet. And if you walk with God under the authority of his word and the empowerment of his Holy Spirit, you will make it. That's why it says, even though, even though, right, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil because what? He is with me. And so we can see that David is, his reality is not matching the revelation. And so because of that, how many people know David was good at encouraging himself in the Lord? So he had to encourage himself in the Lord. And that's exactly what he's doing. He's, re- he's realizing the blessing of what comes from being a believer. And David is recalling and missing his homeland. And how all Israel will come together yearly for these feasts. At, and, 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 and they would come and they would come in unity. It would be, how many people know, like, like it's when you get together with the family members you like. You know, they ain't, the other ones ain't watching. That's why they're heathen, you know. But how many people know when you get together with the right group of people and everything is clicking, right? Come on now. Come on. How many people know what that feels like? That's what David's recalling when he's with his people, when he's with his people, not just with his people socializing, but when he's with his people worshiping. When he's with his people worshiping, their differences don't get in the way. When he's with these people worshiping, their nationalities don't get in the way. Their background, their history doesn't get in the way. When, they're, when he's with his people, there's only one thing that they come for, and that's to look at God. And he's longing for this because he's, he's removed from it. And so in Psalm 133, verse 1, I'm going to read it to you again. It says, Behold how good and pleasant it is. For brothers to dwell together in unity. The NIV said God's people. Amen. So brothers and sisters and everybody said amen. Amen. So when he says behold. Here's the first thing as we take this journey in this passage over the next two weeks. When you see the word behold, right? This is how we normally read it in our devotions. Behold how good and pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. God's people behold. Okay, good. And and it's it's not like behold, I'm about to do a magic trick. Like, behold, I'm about to make the woman disappear. He's not saying that. I want you to understand what God means when he says behold. When he says behold in his word, when David wrote behold in his word, this is what it means. Write it down. It means listen up. It means stop what you're doing. It means take note. Stop the presses. What is about to be said is such a priority to God and will be such a blessing to you that we must not only consider it and give it attention, but we must practice it. Did you catch that? It's stop what you're doing. It's listen to what God is saying. It's saying that this is big to God. This is one on the top ten list. Do you understand? And that it doesn't just merit listening. It merits doing. How many people have ever listened to something but not did it? You know, save the planet. 
Get rid of plastic bags. How many people? You got those plastic bags in the house, and it's like gold. You know, when you got to throw something out real quick, come on now. How many people miss those key food bags? How many people, every time you go to the store, you forget the reusable bags, and you got to buy more? It's a scam, I'm telling you. I got 75 bags in my, in my house, not in my trunk. The stop and shop people really know what they're doing. But how many people, you've ever been told something, and it goes one ear out the other? What, what, what David is saying and what God is saying through David is that he's about to give a revelation. Like a revelation that was given to the churches, right? He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit of God is saying. And when he says, he who has an ear to hear, she who has an ear to hear, he's not just saying, oh, listen, like it's poetry. And then we all just like, yeah, that's good. No, he's not saying listen like it's poetry. He's saying listen and practice what I'm, what I'm saying to you. Because every time he says, he who has an ear, she who has an ear, it was not only to give them a revelation, but it was give them a revelation so that they could put the revelation into practice. Because like my friend Scott Caesar says, the only scripture you believe is the one that you obey. And so this is not only David reminiscing about this, this home, but it is also now him saying to us through the Holy Spirit, this needs to happen. In James 1, to 25. So when he says behold, it's not just listen, it's do. So James 1, and 25, turn there with me in your Bibles. You know, you, you got to forgive me because I started preaching in the 90s and we didn't have no internet and everybody had a Bible. So when I would say turn the Bibles, there'd be like a wind that filled the, the sanctuary. Everybody zip their, unzip their Bible in this protective sleeve, right? Come on now, get to the word. I mean, we didn't even have, some of you are like, honestly, the scriptures are right behind you. Why are we turning to anything? <laughs> Back in the day, remember, we had that poor soul that used to work the overhead projector, always have his thumb, and they'd always pick the person who got like four fingers to do the overhead projector. So you, <laughs> they'd be having like shadows, shadow puppets. You're going to get this one day, guys. I promise you. You'll listen to this and you'll get that again. But if you're in your word right now, whether you're on the phone or you're watching here online, right, I want you to get in the habit of turning there because I want you to be proficient in you using the word because you're going to need to share this with somebody. The word of God is life. Amen. You got to get used. You got to learn how to use the sword. You understand? So, so start learning how to open it. Get it. You know, listen, I did a funeral yesterday. Here's the reason why you need, and Jonathan will know, because we, we, we were there together. And pray for the Turner family. If they're here, if you're watching, we love you guys. But the, the way the funeral home was, we, 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 um, they, they said goodbye to their brother. He passed away. So, so we're praying for the Turner family. Amen? But I had my notes. My notes were on the iPad. And I, went, I, I had to look for a Bible verse. And I was like, I'll just pull up you version. There was no internet. There was like, it was like wherever we were in the funeral home, there was no internet. And I started to get nervous. I was like, I don't have a Bible, but how many people know every good deputy carries a backup? You understand what I'm saying? And I went to the, I went to the paper. And I, because I know how to use the paper, I was able to preach a sermon. You understand what I'm saying? So get used to getting around in the Word of God. Public service announcement, the more you know. James 1, 22 to 25 says this. Are you ready? Let's say it together. Let's read it together. Let's read together the Word of God. NIV. Here we go. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard but doing it, they will be blessed in all that they do. And so when it says that not only those who look into the word but says what, they, what it does, you'll be blessed in all that you do. Come on now. How many people have seen that in your life, that you have been blessed in everything you put your hand to because what you, what you do in line with the word, it not only blesses you, it hits your family, it hits, your, it hits generations. Come on now. How many people know there's power in this word? There is, there is anointing in this word. There's direction in this word. There's healing in this word. There's encouragement 
encouragement in this word. Come on, how many people have ever opened up this word and you, you just got the word right there and God encouraged you? Come on now. It's living. It knows. It's, 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 it's written by God to you. It's his love letter. And God is saying that we are not only to hear it and say, oh, that's nice, but we're to do it. Because the only scripture you believe is the one that you obey. And when he says, behold, it's not just listen, but it's to not only do, but it's to, to adopt it in your life as standard practice. I want you to understand, behold means not only to hear and not only to do, but it means to adopt it into your life as standard practice. In, 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 in other words, like when, when, when you read that scripture, you should be singing the song, this is how we do it. Right? Come on. How many? I know everyone says it now, but how many people remember back when it, when it came out, like, and it was new and it was fresh, and you were the first one that when somebody says, oh, do you, uh, do you boil or grill your hot dogs? We grill it. This is how we do it. <laughs> you know, maybe you didn't do the sachet at the end, but, but do you understand what I'm saying? It becomes, it, it just becomes something you have to try to do. It becomes such a part of you that it's natural. And so when it says behold, it's not just something that we have to agonizingly do, like flossing. No? Come on now, let's just be real. Let's just be real. How many people, you're just not really the flossing type. You're good with the brush. You see, why are you not? Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. You in the back. Me and you, that's why I get those other things. All right, how many people, you just like flossing is great for you. It's fun. You love it. One person. The rest of you are lying. We need to repent right now. It, it needs to be something that is not laborious, but natural. And when David says, behold, it's that this should be something that is second nature to the people of God. So it says how good and pleasant it is when you act upon the word that God has given you, when you dwell in unity. You see, good and pleasant, it means noticeably, noticeably enjoyable, right? Noticeably enjoyable. Like, have you ever taken a bite of something and, and you're just like, whoa, noticeably enjoyable? Have you ever smelt an aroma and you're like, whoa, noticeably enjoyable? H have you ever been to a place and somebody made olive bread and seasoned oil and you were like, noticeably enjoyable? Come on, now, you weren't expecting all that and all of a sudden they got fresh herbs in that thing. You're doing a mop job in that person's oil. You're like, noticeably enjoyable. There we go. What I'm saying is when it's good and pleasant, here's is what's noticeably enjoyable. Number one, it's noticeably enjoyable to God. I want you to write this down. When I, when I honor this scripture, it is noticeably enjoyable to God. It's pleasant to him. Amen? It is noticeably enjoyable to you who participate in it. So it's noticeably enjoyable means it edifies me. Edification means it makes me better. But the third thing is that it's noticeably enjoyable to the people around us. Do you realize when you get out of your car, you send a message to this neighborhood? To Muslims and Sikhs and Hindus that now have immigrated and live in our neighborhood from various parts around the world, when you get out of your car, right, and your kids are like, stop touching me. Will you stop touching me? Don't stop touching me. And then, and then you say to your husband, you wore that to church? Any man who looks at his face in a mirror and then forgets what, you know, and you're arguing or you're complaining about the church, or you're whatever, or you just don't look happy, do you realize what aroma does that give to the world? Do you realize that we are called to be the light of the world and the salt of the earth, and that the aroma of unity not only blesses here in this church, but it emanates outside of this church that the world will know who Jesus is. And so when we talk about unity, what does unity mean? Because how many people know you can be unified about a lot of things, like the Yankees are the greatest team ever, and that's just a lie. I mean, statistics are one thing, but really gut feeling and loyalty and colors of orange and blue. How many people know you can be unified about a lot of things, but you can also be unified about what's wrong? So how do we have unity? So unity is not liking each other. Although if you're unified under the right thing, you will like each other. Unity is not just that we agree. Unity is a resolution that, number one, we are under the authority of the Word of God. That we believe, number one, we're all on the same page that this Word is truth. It is not subjective. It is not ancient. It is not flawed. It is flawless. 
So we're in unity of opinion that the governing document of our relationship in this church and our life is truth, capital T. It is living, capital L. It is effective, capital E. It is everything we need to govern our lives, to govern this church, and to be a blessing in this world. Amen? Amen. So we are unified under the fact of the sovereignty of God and the truth of his word. And I know that things got boring there, but here's the deal. If you're not unified under that truth, if this Bible is a suggestion, if only certain things uh, are are relevant to you, then you will not be unified in purpose as a church. We must be unified under the full counsel of the Word of God, Genesis to Revelation, and everything in between. And that we must understand that when, when Jesus talks about his prayer, in John 17, 20 to 25, I want you to turn there with me, that he's speaking about this unity. So as you're turning there, John chapter 17, verses 20 to 25. Now all you guys are making loud noises with your pages, like, let's let them know we brought our floppy Bible too. You guys doing okay? You with me? Is this blessing somebody? Amen. So unity, okay? Unity. Unity is built on love. And the greatest command is to love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength, then to love your neighbor as yourself, okay? That's a sacrificing love. That's a agape love. It's also connotating a phileo love. So love God with all of your heart. That's an agape love. Phileo love, love your brother as yourself. Phileo, right? Phileo fish? No. Philadelphia. Philadelphia, the city of what? Right? Brotherly love with the angriest fillies. And flyers. People know Philly fans are intense. But the reality is, is that the unity that we need to walk in is a brotherly love, a sacrificial love, and then, and then agapeo. Agapeo love is a derivative of, of agape love. And in the Greek, it's a moral love, a moral love. It means doing the right thing for the right reason at the right time. It means I will do unto others as they would want it to be done to them. It means living with empathy. Living with empathy. You know what empathy is? Empathy is not only seeing that somebody's hurting, but it's it's, it's almost understanding and feeling the very pain that they're feeling themselves. It's putting yourself in their shoes, but it's also then treating them as they need to be treated because you're feeling their pain. And the only way I could have empathy for a lost and dying world, and the only way I could truly have love for somebody that is unlovable, because it's easy to love the people that are like you, but it's harder to love people that are not like you, is that I am under the governance and the authority of the Word of God of the leadership of the Holy Spirit and the empowerment, the guiding of the Holy Spirit with Jesus Christ as my Lord. I cannot love without the Word governing my life and the Spirit empowering me to live out the Word. Does that make sense? Because if you don't, you will, you will only will yourself to try and do these things, right? Because let's just be honest, how many people know alliances only last for a life, for a little bit, Right? Think about it. Do you realize that the Italians in World War II were linked up with the Germans? Right? I apologize on behalf of my people. All right? But that didn't last. That eventually broke up. It was an alliance of convenience, and they tried to will the people to even accept that alliance. But how many people know the will of the people was greater than the will of the alliance? And eventually the people won over. And do you realize back at the time, to defeat the Nazis, the United States was allies with Russia. Man, you guys were a step ahead of me, man. Big Stalin fans in the house. Let's hear it for Stalin. Yeah. Huh? Come on. No, he was actually, yeah, anyway. But do you understand what I'm saying? Alliances only last for a little bit when it is not governed by biblical godly love. A true alliance that is governed by the word of God that says this. Look at somebody say this. Even though you're not perfect, I still love you. You see, because when you're governed, listen to me now. When you're governed by the love of Christ, you know, I understand people get hurt in church, but I think that's become a scapegoat for not attending and not being held accountable. 
I've been hurting the church. No, you weren't hurting the church. You know what you did? You disobeyed the covering of the word of God because when you got hurt, you didn't go to that person like the Bible said and tell them that they hurt you. You started talking about that person behind their back, going to everybody else except them. And now because things are awkward, you don't want to go and see them face to face because you're saying, well, either they leave or I leave and you leave and you leave with unresolved issues. And that's what you call church hurt. Because if we were really the biblical church that God has called us to be under the word of God, it says this. Listen, let's just bring it down. Who does he call us? Who does he call the church in the word? He calls us the bride of Christ. The bride of Christ. The illustration that he gives of the marriage that we're supposed to have with him is that of a husband and a wife. Husbands and wives. We, <laughs> close your ears. Close your ears. You know, just just go, go and light some fireworks off and then come back in five minutes. Husbands and wives, have you ever had an argument? A bad one? And what keeps you married to that person? Covenant. Covenant and commitment that under God's eyes you made a covenant. <laughs> I promise to love and to hold you in good times and in bad. In sickness and in health. <laughs> Death do us part. And now I'd like to sing a song to my lady. I swear. Right? And we get so caught up in the pageantry of marriage that we forget six months down the road. You're arguing about where we're going to go for Christmas. And you have this big argument. And you say things that you don't want to say to each other. And, 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 and you're not thinking about in good times and bad. You're thinking about, did I, did I even sign up for this? But what keeps you in the marriage is the fact that you are governed by a covenant that has been established in the word of God. That what God has joined together, let no man separate, even if that man is your husband. And you are empowered by the Holy Spirit, you understand what I'm saying, to work through this together. Now, I understand that there's outlying circumstances, so I'm not making a blanket statement. But understand this in the marriages that are here that are still standing, right? I'm still standing. How many people you have found that the strength of your marriage has come when both husband and wife have taken the time to work on the problem together? And when you work on the problem together, you get through the problem together. And that which used to be a snare to you now becomes something you have overcome and you're stronger. How many people, how many married couples you have been strengthened by the fact that even in disagreement and problems within the marriage... If you've gone through it with the Lord, and both husbands and wives have been willing participants in this, as you've gone through it together, the very problem that almost destroyed you made you stronger, and you're more in love now. And so in a church, get it out of your mind that I'm never going to offend you. You know, I feel like Jesus at the well right now. The woman comes to him and says, he says, get me a drink. He says, oh, you, uh, why do you want me to get a drink? I'm a Samaritan. And he says, no, but you've had five husbands, and the one you're living with is not yours. And I feel like somebody need to hear, you've had five churches that you've left with unresolved issues, and now I'm the boyfriend. And I'm not trying to say that to upset you, but I'm just trying to say is that there is no perfect church. There is no perfect pastor. There is no perfect worship set. There is no perfect congregation. Yours was perfect, though. Don't worry about it. But do you understand what I'm saying? There's not one worship set ever sung in the history of, of church that has ever appealed to everybody that's in the, in the... Come on. How many people had to sit through this in the 80s and the 90s? Jehovah Jireh, my provider, his grace is sufficient for me, for me, for me. It's good now because you haven't heard it in 20 years. But what happens when it was the song that was sung every week for 20 straight weeks? It was like Casey Kasem, like this one comes from San Diego with love, Jehovah Jireh. <laughs> How many people know, like at some point, you got to change the station, K-Love. For the 700th week, newsboys. You know, it's like, okay, we get it. Right? Like, at some point, you're going to hear all the songs. At some point, you're going to hear all of my anecdotes. 
At some point, you're going to be able to finish my sentences. Two people who are my heroes in life, T.D. Jakes and, B and Pastor Tommy Barnett, I could finish their sentences. I've listened to them so much, I can finish their sentences. And so eventually, you will not be enamored by the preaching. You will not be enamored by the, by the worship, although the preaching and the worship will bless you. But if your heart's in the wrong place and you're carrying offense, none of that's going to make a difference in your life. In the Bible, when you're governed by the Bible, it says, if I got beef with my brother or my sister, I go to them, I bring it to them, and we try and squash it because we want the offering, we want the offering to be accepted by the Lord. And if it's not going to work between me and them, then we're going to go to we're going to go to the elders, and we're going to we're going to ask the elders to help us bring peace to this relationship. The purpose of a how many people know in a disagreement? It may not be that you're totally right. D did you hear that? How many people know in a disagreement, you, you may not be totally right, and guess what? You may not be totally wrong either. In a disagreement, there's what you did, there's what they did, and then there's what really happened. And in the words of Ricardo Montalban, it takes two to tango. I don't even know if he said it, but it sounds like it's something he would say. And how many people know there's their side, there's your side, and then there's what really happened? And do you know in a marriage the biggest gift that God has given you? Collaboration. Look at somebody and say collaboration. Okay? Collaboration is not I win, you lose. Collaboration is we both win. And you know what collaboration takes? A dying to oneself, a dying to pride, and a desire to also see the other person blessed in return. It's not that you win and your needs get met, but like I told these couples, a person is in love when meeting the emotional needs of the other person becomes meeting their own needs. And you've got to get to the point where because you're under the authority of the word of God, that you see each other, not as like, I'm in this until I get offended. I'm in this until, like, the worship starts turning and they're not singing my song. I'm in this until, like, the preaching don't feed me. No. you got to understand, he's called you to be part of this body. And you're in this until Jesus comes because you're, you have a purpose in this body to glorify and magnify the Lord and be a witness to this community. Amen? And so you got to realize, look at somebody and say, we may get into a disagreement. Look at somebody beside your spouse. Come on, let's do this. We're going to have issues. We're going to have beef. And now that social media is on, it's going to be intensified. How many people remember before social media? Nobody really, everybody generally got along. Now that we can see everybody's thoughts broadcast, like, I don't like that person. But when I'm governed by the word of God, I'm not only supposed to love the people who are easy, but I'm also supposed to pray for the people that persecute me. That means I got to pray for Putin? <laughs> I feel like he should drive a Hummer and have to pay the bill for the rest of his life for these gas prices. But we got to pray for the dude. And I could throw out a lot of other political figures that would probably make you angrier. Blow the trumpet in Zion, Zion. <laughs> Huh? Huh? But I don't care how nasty they are, how dirty they are, how much you don't like them, they're still people who were created by God. The son of Sam ravaged this city for years, murdered people, and he's a born-again believer in prison that's making a difference for Jesus in the prison. He, underst he was demonically possessed, and God got a hold of his life, and he was forgiven. And he's done such a work in his life that in his interviews he says, I know what I've done. I understand. I'm not looking to get out of prison. I just know that I'm, I have a new, a, new, a new life and I'm going to see Jesus in heaven and I'll just do everything I can on this earth. Do you understand what I'm saying? If God can save the son of Sam, he can save the trumpet. And I'm just biding my time to just say the other guy too.
But how will they hear unless somebody's preaching to them? And how will they know unless somebody's praying for them? And I ain't just talking about biding my time and playing my trumpets. I'm talking about your next door neighbor. I'm talking about the people who you got beef with. I'm talking about the people that hurt you. And Jesus said this in John chapter 17, verses 20 to 25. It says, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray for those. This is Jesus' prayer for his, for his people. This is his prayer for you right before his crucifixion. He didn't have the benefit of using all the words in the world, so he, he, his time was limited, so he had to be very guarded with what he said and purposeful, and this is his recorded prayer for you. My prayer is not for them alone, the disciples he's talking about. I also pray for those who believe in me through the disciples' message that all of them may be one, that in this church we may be one, what? Not that we just get along, that we like each other, that we all agree, that, that like, you know, we like, we like Pernil and Pasteles and Arroz con Dules, con Pollo, Rice and Peas, Peas and Rice, Hardo Bread, come on now, right? It's not that we agree that we're, we're multicultural because how many people, that could also become an idol and a god to think that we're better than the churches that are all one thing. I mean, we are, but let's, <laughs> right? But how many people know it's not unity that we like each other or that we're even copacetic with our variety here, but that we are unity in one, in love for each other because we are governed by the word of God and empowered by the Holy Spirit, right? Okay, let's keep, let's keep going. It's blessing somebody. Father, just as you are in me and I in you, May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you have given me, that they may be one as we are one. I and them and you and me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. The word will know, listen to this, the world will know that you sent me and have loved me even as you have loved me. But listen to this, this the reason we need to be one is, number one, it's glorifying to the Father. It honors him. Number two, it's beneficial to us. But number three, it's that the world would see us as his disciples. So let me ask you a question. I'm going to close it soon. And you come back for week two. Sound good? What's the world's view of the church? not good but here's the problem too many people blame the bible well the bible's an outdated book it was written by man it's flawless it's uh, subjective and you know it, some of it's good but not all of it's good and some people believe blame the bible some people blame the church organized religion is bad it's nothing but bad and it separates men and it's people and power and money and all the people who ever complain all the church wants is money Never go to church and understand what happens in a church with that money. Now, I do understand that some of you went to churches where the pastor drove a Cadillac. I drive a Chevy. Thank you very much. Um, and there was not integrity with the finances, and I understand that. But understand you give to God, not to man, and that man is accountable for what they do with that money. And ultimately, when you give to God, he still blesses you regardless. You understand what I'm saying? Church hurt. The word supersedes your hurt. And guess what? When I give to that church and if that pastor's pocketing the money, going to Aruba on his private jet, driving his Cadillac, eating his ceviche on church dollar, I gave it to God, not to him. And I understand he, going, he better watch it when he's in that plane going down to Aruba because it's about to go down if he keeps playing with God's people and God's money. But my issue is this, is that I gave it to the Lord and my blessing is still coming because it's not his money, it's God's money. It's not, you see, why, how can I say that? Because I let my pride and my desire to be Judge Judy get out of the way and I let the word of God govern me to know that the source of who I give to is the source who, play, who provides for me because it's written in the word. And I also know that when somebody does not walk with integrity, pride goes before a fall and it won't be long because what's done in secret comes out in the light, bro. 
So I can rest assured in peace to know that even in situations like that, now it doesn't mean you stay in that church, you could leave, that's fine, but don't get bitter at God and not give in the next church because you got burnt in that church. You know why, how you can do that? Because you're governed by the word, not your emotions. And that's the unity we're talking about. Not an emotional unity, right? But a unity that is founded in the word of God. And uh, so when we look at the, the people's opinion of the church, it's not the church's fault, generally. There's some stinkers. But how many people believe with me that there are churches that are doing good work? That are paying the rap for like, like a percentage of the people that maybe kind of dropped the ball. Are you happy with this church? Do you, do you know the work that God has been able to do? Come on now. I praise God for this family. Praise God for this church. And yeah, we've had disagreements. And yeah, we've had people leave. But man, I pray they come back and we can reconcile. Some of the greatest blessings of my ministry have been people that I've had beef with that have had the courage to come to me to say, hey, pastor, I had this beef with you. And then we squashed it. And guess what? We're friends now. Do you know why? Who is not governed by emotion or pride. We're governed by the word. So here's the deal. You know whose fault it is that the church at large has a horrible reputation in the community, it's, it's not the church establishment. It's actually the church members. Not us, but the rest of them. <laughs> Point in case. I'm in Dunkin' Donuts. I'm getting my extra large coffee with extra cream and eight splendid. Don't judge. And I'm, I'm online. And I hear this woman on a phone, and she's talking about a church and how she don't like it and her pastor, and she's, she's, she ain't eating anything except him. And she's speaking loud for all the Dunkin' Donuts to hear. So I, I turn around thinking it's one of the people from Belrose. I'm starting to look. <laughs> I'm like, what did I do? <laughs> I realize it's not. It's somebody else's problem. I was like, thank God that's not my sheep. You know, that'd be on a restaurant menu right now. You know what I'm saying? Lamb chop, 10.99, fried. <laughs> One can only dream. And this woman was, now, here I am, a pastor, and I, I get it because I know the business. I, I get it. It's par for the course. You know what I mean? But there were people in that church from all over the community, New High Park and Floor Park, and I could imagine as this woman was broadcasting her dissatisfaction with the pastor, who she probably never went to and talked to him about it himself, what idea of the church was everyone else getting from that woman? Why on earth would they ever want to go to a church that this woman is at? Because if she could talk about the pastor, the, the person who's leading the church, if I come to that church, who knows if I'm next on the menu at Dunkin' Donuts. Do you understand what I'm saying? So be careful what you post on social media. Be careful what you say out loud and in public. Be careful who you confide in because you're speaking about his bride. You speak about Rachel? You come to me, you say something about Rachel? Rachel? I know I'm fat, but I got 30 seconds of explosive cardio that I can unload on you before Phil has to grab the defibrillators to resuscitate me. You speak about Rachel, we throw in hands until the ambulance comes for me. You got to be vigilant about this church, about his church. And discipleship means that when you see a sheep going, meh, 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 whether it's about the pastor or it's about a believer, you don't take part in the gossip. You keep your mouth shut. And you say, hey, you know what? If you've got such a problem, why don't you let them know? They'd be talking. I can't believe this person. They did this, this. Okay, hold on a second. Here, they're on the phone. Talk to them. Oh, hi. <laughs> oh, bark, no bite. Rufus, you understand? But what allows me, number one, 
It's the word. But number two, it's the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to bite my tongue, hold back my flesh, and do the kingdom thing rather than the fleshly thing. Because when you build the kingdom, God builds you. When you destroy the kingdom, both you and the kingdom suffer. And we have to be builders of the kingdom by the unity we demonstrate in this place. Last story to make you laugh and have a little sympathy for me. Some of you are wondering what this is. This is the remains of my first dog, Tam Tam. No, just kidding. It's cologne. <laughs> Relax. Catch! <laughs> Listen, I submitted my last paper for school yesterday. I'm free. You got me back. Woo. Sorry, Cheryl. I'll be there to help you. Okay. So we're on vacation in Disney, okay? 2018, I think it was. And I love cologne. I love uh, my grandmother. She used to work at Stearns. It used to be Gertz. Come on now. How many people remember that, right? And she, for Christmas, she would always get us cologne because she got a discount from the store. She used to come home. She used to work. She used to come home with a plastic bag, the see-through bag. My, my grandmother would always get us cologne. I, I, and my uncle actually worked for Gloria Vanderbilt. Uh, and Gloria Vanderbilt was, uh, was connected to also Ralph Lauren. So, like, when I was young, Grandma would buy, you know, the unlimited Pierre Cardin or the English leather or whatever that was nasty back then, but... Nonetheless, got me started. It was my starter kit. But then when my uncle started working for Gloria Vanderbilt and Ralph Lauren, I used to get the polo. I used to get every, everybody in the family had Gloria Vanderbilt, you know, perfume on from back in the day. You know what I mean? And their Sergio Valentes. And so it started my love of cologne. And because I accumulated all this stuff over the years from the generosity of my grandmother, my uncle, and various other people who got me cologne, I had always had a collection of like 10 to 15 bottles just waiting to be used. Then Josh got me hooked up to this place called fragrance.net with a 33% discount, so now I don't even buy my stuff at Macy's anymore. Every year for Christmas and Father's Day, I tell the kids, just get me cologne. Just get me cologne. Because I asked once Rachel to get me a survival knife. She got the totally different survival knife, and God bless her, but I just, just get me cologne from now on. So they knew I love cologne. So I was in Disney, and I went to Epcot. And you know Epcot, you got the World Showcase, right? And the World Showcase, they got all these countries from, you know, the world in the 1950s, apparently, right? So, so you, know, you go, and you got Mexico, you got Spain, you got, uh, you don't have Spain. You got, do you have Spain? No, you don't have Spain. You got France, you got Canada, you got all these places. And so they got Italy, right next to the American Pavilion, next to Germany. And in all these places, they have colognes from around the world. And so I remember Rachel, she buys the one cologne that she gets, or the, the spray that she gets, is from Norway. It's called Gear Nice, and it's always sold in the Norway Pavilion, so we get it for her. And then one time, I, I got the, the man cologne for that. So I was like, let me go to Italy. Let me give my people some business. And so I go into the Italian Pavilion, and these, these two Italian women who work there, you know, from the motherland, I was like, I'm like, surely they're going to give me the discount. They're like, what's your name, sir? I was like, Domenico. <laughs> Domenico Cotignola. <laughs> you know, in America, it's like, hi, I'm Dom Cotignola. Ball for my Italian people, I'm Domenico Cotignola. <laughs> Arrivederci. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm, I'm there, and they saw, but here's the deal. They didn't see me as their paisan. They say, hey, American with money, come on, let's go. <laughs> now, I'm not even in real Italy. This is, the, this is the comedy of it all. I'm in fake Italy talking to real Italians who are about to take me for a ride. So I go to the Bulgari section. I knew it should have been expensive because they replaced the U with a V. <laughs> and they see me coming, and they start spraying me. All of a sudden, oh, you like the cologne for your wife, huh? You get the cologne for your wife. And I was like, yeah, you know, I like the cologne from, you know, oh, I want to smell nice for my lady here. I was like, because I'm married, you know what I mean? So I'm not available, so don't touch. <laughs> and uh, they start spraying me. So she starts spraying me. Smell that. I was like, oh, that, that's good. Kind of smells like Catholic mass when there's a funeral, but you got another one? <laughs> okay, hold on. Smell that. I'm going to play with your mind now. I'm going to totally change your mind. You're going to we're going to find one before you leave. I was like, all right, change my mind. Then she... She puts a jar of coffee beans right in front of my nose that's been sniffed by everybody else in the park. And she said, sniff the coffee to refresh your nasal palate. I was like, okay. 
She starts spraying me. I got, I got more sprays. I looked like I was taking an allergy test that day. She's spraying me. And now, now we get down to, through various rounds of coffee and sniffs, we get down to two fragrances. Now the kids are smelling my arm. The, my wife is smelling my arm. She's having total strangers come. Smell his arm. Tell me which one you like. <laughs> so then she narrows it down to this one and to another one. And she then she puts it on the two available spots on my body where there is no cologne. And she says, okay, which one do you like? I was like, well, I like this one. I said, how much is it? She's like, so it's about $324. $324, what? I said, you better embalm me for that price with this stuff. <laughs> so then I'm like, there's no way I can pay this. It's like, we're going to have to hitchhike home. The kids are going to have to wash dishes for us to get the gas to get home. And so I leave. But the whole time, like they got in my head. Smell it. Your wife, she likes it. Oh, yes, big, strong. And that, I was working out, too, so I was looking like buffed with the sweat. I was glistening in the sun. <laughs> and here I am walking around Epcot like, <laughs> Bulgari. <laughs> I was like, then I was like, smell this. <laughs> I mean, it's $300, but she says, there's a difference. I said, why is this $300 and that one's $120? And why didn't you show me that one? She said, because this is different. This is the perfume. Is the oil, is the ODP. And I said, say it again, ODP. And she says, this is going to last you longer. One spray goes a long way. She says, you'll have this for years versus that you'll run out. I thought she was joking. So then I said, I said Rachel, should I get it? I said, because she says it's going to last three years, and I'm going to have to buy, buy a couple of bottles. And I was, now I'm doing the math like I'm buying a timeshare. Well, well, ultimately in three years we'll save. I mean, Rebecca won't have shoes, but we'll save. So anyway, no, I'm going along, but let me get to the, let me cut to the chase. My kids said, Dad, let's get it for you. Every year you take us to Disney. You always plan vacations. You never buy anything for yourself. You always get us a souvenir. We want to do something for you. So they, they snuck out, and they went, and they bought it. And then they come to me with the thing. And it's touching, except they use my credit card. <laughs> <laughs> How is that a gift? How is that even? I said, well, you guys just ruined the vacation. We're fasting now. You know, we can't. But the interesting thing is, it was the smell and the aroma of the cologne that brought me back to that store to make me want to buy into whatever they had because I couldn't get it out of my mind. And this bottle has lasted me since 2018. Yeah. She's surprised. Like, wow, yeah. <laughs> you want to buy one? I got one right here, half used. <laughs> Who wants some? Come on. Who wants some? Look at this. She, she, rub it together. That's strong. I just gave you like three days supply. <laughs> She won't be able to resist you. <laughs> so here's the deal. When you walk in unity, it's probably horrible. She's, she's having an allergic reaction. <laughs> but when you walk in unity, you affirmed it. Tell, is it good? It's delicious. It's delicious. <laughs> Will you with distance? <laughs> All right. How many people? This whole section, I've lost you because you're in the aroma. So here's the beautiful thing. Okay, stop sharing the scent with everybody. We've, I don't have, I, I can't go back to Disney. I'm broke, but I'll hit you after service. All right, good. Joan, where did we go with this? So here's the deal. When, when you walk in the aroma of unity and the aroma of the Lord, you don't need a $300 cologne. What you have is more priceless. And it lasts. And it's worth it. So I charge you to come back next week. We'll finish the sermon. But I charge you as you leave this place 
Walk out of this place with the aroma of unity in you. Be the church. Dwell together. And let's go touch this city and give people the true representation of who Jesus is. Amen. Amen.